Hey, everybody, before we get to this week's episode, I want to let you know we're launching YouTube memberships. A long time now, people have been telling me they don't like listening to the show. They like watching the show. That's why they're on YouTube. So we're going to meet that demand. And starting today, all membership episodes, all overtime conversations will be posted here on YouTube moving forward. In fact, I knew this day was coming. So February shows, all the membership shows that came out in February are here on YouTube as well, waiting for you. All you got to do is hit that join button, become a YouTube member, and you can binge the entire month of February. And you can watch the overtime segment that we have for today's episode right here on YouTube. And then moving forward, all the content is available to you as YouTube members. Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long, bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave, and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow this head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over, and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush, and I touch air. Couldn't breathe, and I couldn't move, because I know I'm seeing a monster. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Merkel. Thanks for being here. If you have a crazy, wild experience you want to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's contact at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, the newly minted website. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. If you want more shows on a weekly basis, Go to theconfessionalspodcast.com and become a member. With your membership, you're going to get access to the Tuesday shows ad-free, overtime segments when they're available, and most importantly, every Thursday, we come out with a members episode just for the members on the website and on the Confessionals appy right there waiting for you. If you haven't done so yet, go ahead and check out Merkel Media Films. We have two of them available on demand on Merkel.media, Exhibition Dog Man and The Shape of Shadows. You tell me which one's your favorite. Don't say neither because that'll hurt my feelings. I personally think that The Shape of Shadows has a lot more action, but Exhibition Dogman is the apple of my eye because it's the first time I ever did something cool in my life. So go ahead, check it out, and you let me know what you guys think. Also, we're going to be getting into some conversation about weaponry and ancient technology and a lot of good talk when it comes to what was being used in these biblical days and in that case, my friends, if you ever come across ancient technology and you accidentally chop your arm off, you might need my medic. And they are actually an affiliate of this show now. So go ahead and check it out in the affiliate section in the description. My medic and other affiliates waiting there for you guys like Faraday bags, generators, EcoFlow generators, which, by the way, I do have an EcoFlow generator. It is fantastic. It's solar powered. It's just awesome. I've ran a lot of things off of it here in East Tennessee. The power goes out a lot. All right, listen, friends, we have a great show coming up here for you today. We have in studio a returning guest for, I don't know, how many how many times you've been here, Joel? Going like 14 now, it's, it's, something it's like It's got to be something like that. We have Joel Thomas here in studio, and we also have Juan from the Juan on Juan podcast. Boys, how are you? The utmost authority on all subjects, Joel Thomas here. <laughs> 
what I heard from some that, people. I mean, listen, that's that's what I hear too. I mean, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Is that is that so, is that something that you've heard in the streets? That's what yeah, that's what the esoteric streets are saying. That he's <laughs> always the 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 main guy for all these topics. But happy to be here, excited. And it's crazy. I was saying that when I first started listening to you, I'd always wonder, like, you know, as a podcaster that started podcasting because of other shows, mm. man, I wish. When, when I go on the confessionals one day, I wonder what I'm going to talk about. And here we are in studio. Yeah. So kids, follow your dreams because they do come true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Follow your dreams. Yeah, and you know, that's the thing, man. Like uh, we were talking a lot about podcasting and stuff. And one thing that um, I've been saying a lot recently to people is that a lot of times people don't see their desires come true because they give up too fast. And and just because the timeline was different for somebody else doesn't mean that timeline is going to be this. It, it, like your timeline is your timeline, you know. And um, I mean, like so. So I think some people might be like, "Oh, well, it happened so fast for Merkel, right?" But compared to who? Because mm -hmm. like literally, on the other side of this country is one of my best friends, and when he started his memberships on his website, like. It didn't take as long for for him to become a podcaster full time like it did for me, you know. And so it's like all of it is timing. And uh, when you look around the room all the time and you're trying to look around and see what everybody else is doing, you often get discouraged and then you stop. And so just have the blinders on, keep going forward, and eventually it will happen because most people give up. And if you don't give up, you're gonna win. Well, I was telling you, Tony, yesterday that. Uh, my pastor said something very interesting that really resonated with me a week ago where he said, you either deal with the pain from regret or the pain from discipline. Mm -hmm. So it's like, are you going to go through that pain of of disciplining yourself to get to where you want to get to? And like you said, man, it could be a long time, could be a short time, but generally speaking, it all happens in seasons and it's how you grow to get to that point because yeah. you're going to have failures. But a lot of people give up because they see failure and it might be the first time, might be the fifth time, but then you didn't know that the sixth time you were actually going to get where mm -hmm. you wanted to get to. And that's a, like you see that meme that's online where that guy's go, digging for gold, the and gold. then the other guy he gives up, and the other guy keeps going, and you see the 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 line there, and you're just, it's right there, right? But that's how I felt. Uh, you know, I, I mean, people know. I, I think people most people know my story where I was a truck driver and stuff like that. And uh, you know, like there were days that. You feel like it's just not gonna happen. It's a grind, bro. And and I'm I mean, I'm talking like straight up in my truck crying because I wanted it so bad and it just felt like it was so far away. But then there was days that I'm like, I'm right there. I can feel it, I can taste it. And I remember hitting a certain point. I don't remember exactly when or what was going on, but I remember hitting a certain point and I'm driving around my truck and it was like in my mind's eye was this image of me being in a dark room, a dark cave. You know, but, uh, and there was a light though. It's like a tunnel and there was a light at the end of the tunnel. It was like symbolic, right? I'm like, there's actually a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm like, it, it was like this thing that just motivated me. And it was like almost every day I had this vision in my head of this light at the end of the tunnel. I'm like for the first time, I actually see light. And I just started envisioning it getting bigger and bigger and stuff. And uh, that kept me going in, in, for another year or two. Because <laughs> <And so, laughs> it was a process. It, it, but, you know, um, Hang on, we got so we got a phone call. We got a phone call going here. Who uh, is that? I've, no, it's it's. I forgot to put my phone on. Do not disturb, which means that it started ringing on my computer. You're lucky too. you're the boss, Tony. Yeah. If not a, I make the rules around here. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> don't anybody else have uh, phone calls during this conversation, or else you're all fired. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, so I want to say your pastor spit some fire, bro, because you told me something else. I thought you were going to bring up what you had texted me that day, where he's pretty much telling you your path isn't you know, supposed to be dictated by another man. You know, every man has his own path and his own thing. Right. So that also resonated with me because, again, we're in this space, community, whatever you want to call it, quote unquote, yeah. uh, where you're worried about what your peers are saying or what the, what you know, other people are commenting and this and that. It's like, no, don't even worry about that. That's extra noise because your path isn't going to be dictated by another man. He has his own path. You have your own path. And if you stick to it and you do it, the, if you do things correctly, yeah, you'll eventually get somewhere. The thing is, we get so consumed with people that are successful and we're like, I want that. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at 
what our success is going to be. Yeah. It's going to be different than that person's. You got you your can, own story. You got your own story to build. And I think that's with anything in life. And that was another thing that resonated with me too. And just let me know that, man, I can block out the outside noise. Who cares? Who cares what anybody's saying? If I'm in the path that I'm supposed to be on and I feel like I am, who cares if I say whatever about whatever topics and somebody doesn't like it? That's they they have nothing to do with me and in my mm-hmm. path. And I think that we have to know that with anything that we're chasing in life. And if we feel like we're going down that calling that we're supposed to be on, it, there's no, there's no reason for us to uh, get caught up in that extra tertiary, you know, ridiculousness. And I've seen the people that are very successful. They want other people to be successful. They're willing to help mm-hmm. those people be successful. There's no jealousy there. And they know that their path is completely different than everybody else's. They're building, they're cut, carving their own way through life. And I think once you realize that, man, you can just, you can let all the other stuff go. It's If anything, it's just funny at that point. It's like, what well, doesn't affect me the same way it used mm-hmm. to? Yeah. 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 And you said something interesting about the, the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Envis- envisioning yourself going and, and, into this other reality. And I just read uh, John, right? The gospel of John and the first verses where he's talking about the word of God and the logos and how right it is God and it becomes flesh and blood and all that. It's interesting because there are certain secret societies and certain groups who meditate upon those first few lines of the really? gospel of John. And they do it in order to, and again, this is what the literature says, that they're able to enter the text. They're able to enter the text and interact with the biblical people inside that story. So there are mm-hmm. stories of these people interacting with Jesus, like going in and seeing it and confirming his existence. So, cause I know we're going to be talking about some interdimensional stuff today too. And I think that's a perfect, you know, envisioning yourself going into the, into really anything, but in specific, the, the Bible, which is what we're going to be talking about a lot today too. And, and some stories, but going into these other dimensions and, I I believe I just did this this crazy interview the other day where we were talking about geometries to access intermediary beings. And he was talking about a certain chaos magician who used his stories and books to take the reader's consciousness and drop them off in other realities. Right? So when you when you're reading a certain book where you kind of you get into this flow state where you're just reading it and going on. Well, there's a certain technique that these that certain occultists use called the, the, the cut-up method where they're able to put you in a different state of mind as you're reading these texts and, they, and, and you don't realize that your consciousness is being transported to these other realms and kind of sort of fighting fights of demonic entities on the other side for them. It's, so it's, it's weird. To your point there, and you and I have talked about a lot of the books that we read because I buy a lot of books that are occult in nature or from occultists or whatever else. And there are times like sometimes you got to put that book down 100%. and pray or pray over the book. You know, I just bought a book recently yesterday. I, before I brought it in the house, I was like, all right, like I'm not going to succumb to this, but I want it for historical purposes and understand, you know, what's going on in these texts and how these people operate. Because if I'm coming from a different angle, I like to know what someone else is thinking and the weapons that they're using against me. So I can do that from my aspect. I don't know how strong everybody is to do that. I don't necessarily suggest that for everybody, but I think you're right that there are books that are written in a way that they're trying to transport your consciousness off of the pages, like Mm -hmm. into somewhere else where demonic entities can interact with you and attack you. Man. That's wow. That's that's sorcery. There, there's this well, literally. <laughs> well, again, grammar, grimoire, like that's connected. That's mm-hmm. where the word uh, grammar comes from, from a, a book of spells. I mean, that's etymology. And there's something. There's a, oh, this stood out to me. There's a string of words that you can either read or say to somebody that will unravel somebody that will quite literally destroy them mentally, physically, whatever that is. But there's a string of words that will destroy you, destroy you. It's just what words are they? Or are they even words, right? They could be noises for all we know, you know? So it, it, it is an interesting concept because we're all reading constantly. Even if it's not like occult literature or anything like that, we're reading stuff on the internet, people's comments or whatever it is. And you're const- constantly interacting with things that people are putting out. 
that are written. So reality itself, I mean, almost all major religions are based off text. So writing is powerful. Writing does have a powerful effect. And then when you add pictures onto that, it, it blows it up even more. Because as a kid, right, you flip through the pages, you look at the the, the pictures, you're not looking at the, the text. Mm -hmm. So there's been also, right, speaking of meditative, and I was trying to find the name for it because it's got a certain name where you you enter the biblical text through, through a sort of meditation, but the Rothschilds, there's this book that I stumbled across, The Rothschilds Canticles, where the the it is a book of plates and it's a book on how to you meditate on it. So they're essentially mandalas that you're able to look at and meditate and you're able to enter these mandalas and it's all about becoming one with God. So interacting. What was the book called? Rothschilds, so like the Rothschild family, yeah. Canticles. Canticles. And it's a book on prayers. And it also has pictures, illuminated, it's like an illuminated manuscript. I've seen it before. It's yeah. a red book. And it's interesting because it's a red book because Carl Jung, Carl Jung's red book was all about that, about writing to be able to interact with this other reality, this other dimension. And he went insane. Well, it also plays into, um, is, is, is this book, uh, like, I don't know. It's at Yale. I, I've, I found it already. Like, mm -hmm. it's online. Is it, is it like something like people are going to like get hypnotized by it when they read it or anything like that? Anything crazy? Because if, if not, I'm just going to put the link in the description uh, for people. Tony, I mean, I, well, I, I already gave the name out. They could find it. If I found it, they could find it. Right. Google it. It's at Yale. Yale. Skull and Bones. Right. Right. I don't believe any of that stuff, by the way. You don't believe any of that stuff? <laughs> I'm, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Listen, dude. We we're talking about that show, 30 Coins. It's about talismans, which we're going to get into today too. Right. The 30 coins that Judas gave up Jesus for. And in this, in this show, they're finding those coins. It's almost like, the right? We grew up with Dragon Ball Z. What's Dragon Ball Z? Collect all the Dragon Balls. And right. you're able to summon this entity, yeah. this djinn, that's able to give you a wish and give you everything that you desire. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that particular book, I, I, I believe, I have a personal opinion that Yale has all the Dragon Balls. They have all the coolest stuff and it's got to do with some sort of relic type, you know? The, yeah, for sure. For power. And I also think the Smithsonian's got off-site places that they keep a lot of things too. And they got all the giant bones, dude. Absolutely. Is this like only one copy of this book? Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. So you can find scanned copies. Again, it's... Yeah. it's a, That's what it looks like. Oh, yeah. dude, I forgot. I completely forgot. Sorry. There's also how to create monstrous races in that book somewhere too. We're talking about dogmen. So uh, that's got something to do on how to be, there's like dogmen in the, I'm seeing it right on here. the sides there. You'll see like the little pictures. Mm -hmm. So it's something about because, again, the Rothschilds, take it for whatever that's worth, but it's about, in my opinion, I think that these people use these sort of things to acquire power. What like, language is this in? I'm not 100%. It's like in, in some certain script. I'm, it might be Latin, but I'm not 100% on that. Don't, don't, don't quote they got, me on that. They got an image of a of crucifixion in here. I don't know if that's supposed to be Jesus or somebody else. Now, the in interesting thing about the Rothschilds, and I think I was talking to you about this yesterday, about how the Rothschilds are not Jewish Oh yeah, from the no. lineage of anything Jewish. Um, they're actually from the Kazarian Mafia, the Kazarians and the Kazarians. I think you can say that on YouTube, dude. You can. So the Kazarians um, are were a nomadic uh, bunch of tribes over in uh, the Middle East, and during this time, they were taking over all these lands, they were taking over the other tribes, so they were building their empire. But they needed a religion to umbrella the the country under. Mm -hmm. So they brought across three different religions. They brought across Judaism, Christianity. And Islam. Well, they realized if they pick Islam or Christianity, they'd be fighting each other, fighting the other. So they picked Judaism and integrated within Judaism to the point that the Rothschilds and all these big figureheads that you see that are Jewish are not actually Jewish. They come from a Kazarian line, which is actually from a Nephilim line that is considered part of the 13 bloodlines. Uh -oh. So this is what the, their goal is, is to push this nephilim bloodline to the forefront um but they hide behind this uh jewish uh moniker 
And that's why people are throwing darts at the wrong people whenever they say, oh, this person's doing this, this person's doing this, or this race is doing this. They don't really know behind the scenes what's been activated um, from the beginning. So you've got that going on. So when you're talking about the text here, um, what, what, where did it really come from? Where, you know what I mean? Like, how long has it been passed down through the bloodlines? How long ago was this? Did it start with like the, the bloodline of Isis or Ishtar that far back from this fallen angel, uh, these fallen angel bloodlines? And it's been passed down through these different generations. One thing I always tell people is the big bad guys that you see are just the front men. They're always the front men. It's kind of like the guys that are the richest in the world. Uh, they're not really the richest in the world. They're just the people that they put out there to say, oh, this guy is the richest in the world. They're probably not even close to the richest in the world. The families that are the richest in the world are trillionaires, and you'll never hear their names. Mm -hmm. So it works in the same uh, operative form um, with these Nephilim bloodlines, and that's what you have to look at. This is where it comes from, um, all the way from uh, before the deluge to after, in which we're going to get into today, one big Nephilim, Goliath, and we're going to talk about this. Wait, Goliath was a Nephilim? <laughs> no way. And we're going to talk about this alchemical story of David and Goliath, and Juan and I have talked about this before, but we're talking about destiny, and it and it really made me think about David and his destiny and like what he was supposed to bring. It wasn't just that David was supposed to be the king over Israel. He was through his bloodline, Yeshua or Jesus was coming from that bloodline. So that's part of what David's uh, destiny was. And we're talking about Goliath being a Nephilim. And we're going to start in first Samuel with Goliath. We're going to talk about what Goliath was. We're going to break down David coming at Goliath. We're going to talk about the stones, which Juan and I have a lot about the stones. We're going to talk about very fantastical gear that Goliath had, fantastical gear that King Saul had as well during this whole story. This is a wild, wild story when you're breaking it down from a, an aspect of what the Hebrew words actually meant. And when you're looking at it from an alchemical lens, because it's really interesting how that operates. But I'm just going to like just paint the picture for anybody out there that has no clue who Goliath is. So you got 1 Samuel 17, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, in the Masore Masoretic text, which is like the original Hebrew, the six cubits in a span is roughly nine feet, six inches. Now, when the Septuagint came along later, the Septuagint tried to repurpose that and say that he was only six feet, six inches tall, yeah. which just isn't just, just isn't true. When you're taking it from the original Hebrew, he was close to 10 feet tall. So we, we do know that. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So he had a crazy smorgasbord of military equipment. His head, the helmet, was 30 pounds. So he literally had 30 pounds on his head. So you're not telling me that six feet, six inches tall, uh, not unless there's soup, he is a thick boy that he's rocking. Like, you're just not putting that on your head and it's like a and hat. It, and if, if you are putting on your head, you're definitely not going to be the mighty warrior that they're claiming you to be. He's ain't, no, ain't nobody, unless, right. his, unless his neck is like, bah, you know? Right. But it gets crazier because we were just talking about his, uh, his, ch his chain mail. 150 pounds. It's like putting That's a crazy. small person, a homunculus, a homunculus, on your body and walking out to war. He's going out to war with that. And he had his greaves, which are, for, for lack of a better word, is like soccer uh, shin guards. So uh, were also made of bronze. They were, they were super strong. Um, so his, uh, his, his uh, spear was like a weaver's beam. It weighed 600 shekels of iron, and we're talking about just the tip of it was like 30 pounds. So that's not even considering the, the entire tip. thing. So he's he's got 30 pounds uh, in his hand as well. So he's walking out there, calling these guys out, all of the Israelites right there. He stood and cried out unto the armies of Israel and said to them, why are ye come out to see your battle in array? I am not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then 
ye shall be our servants and serve us. So he's outside yapping. He's like, bring somebody to me. They're not, they're not even going to attack army to army. He's like, you know what? I'll come by myself. And, and, and in those days, it's very normal. You take the head of one army, head of another army. If they're going to go at it, whoever wins, you know, it, it, it saves a lot of bloodshed and death. It's like, okay, if we lose, yeah, we'll be your slaves and, you know, we'll just work for you or whatever. A lot of those soldiers would be like, yeah, we'll just be soldiers for the other army. They don't care. It's like working for a job that you don't really like anyway. You're like, well, maybe that job is better. Maybe if our awful boss I loses. I to work for Nephilim. Nephilim yeah. <laughs> Nephil- I think there's a company called Nephilim Incorporated. Is that? I, I think I might be. Yeah. Are you I, serious? I think so. I, I, really, really, I got to look this up. <laughs> Hold on, gonna, like Nephilim. <laughs> let's look this up. Did my keyboard go into sleep mode? There we go. Nephilim Incorporated. Yeah. Nephilim Incorporated. From like Africa or something. <laughs> wow. Like that. So shout out to those guys. Wow. Wow. Nephilim Incorporated. That's it. it Belize, which is interesting. <laughs> in we, Belize, yeah, yeah, yeah. We just we just did a show on Belize. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Nephilim yeah. coming out of the sky there. Yeah. So I I looked that up. I think it was either Nephilim technology or something like that. Where it, it's interesting, and, and I want to also say that pause. There's way more. Nephilim Inc. in Idaho, Nephilim Inc. in Delaware, Nephilim Inc. in New York, Bay Area Nephilim uh, in California. Nephilim game uh, game studios in Florida, Nephilim Holding Group in New York, Nephilim Enterprises in Nevada, Nephilim Group in California, Nephilim Game Studios in Oregon, Nephilim Game Studios in Oregon. That's wild. They're not even hiding anymore, bro. They're not even hi- they're just like the game studios, man. <laughs> they're putting Nephilim in our games, so, man. And that's true. <laughs> so Juan and I did a show almost a year ago where we were talking about uh Tying in ancient technology and Nephilim, and we actually talked about now Nephilim now, and there are so many video games where there's Nephilim lore, and yes. it's spoken of as Nephilim or Nephilim mm. in these video games, and this has been going on for like twenty years, and nobody yeah. really knows. They just thought it was a cool thing, like oh man, these are like these cool hybrid hybridized, you know, fallen entities or Anunnaki, you know, hybridized beings, and they don't realize like well, this is a real thing. These mm. are. Uh, the products of a fallen in- entities having sex with the daughters of men and creating these things, but now you're playing as them in video games because they'll be the star characters. Yeah, and and I want to add that right the way I look at the Bible, I I am aware of all of its layers because it, it is an inter- interdimensional text, and I do 100 percent believe that, and I believe that because it's got its alchemical perspective. There's seven different ways, right? The seven different seals that you can interpret something. Mm-hmm. I think alchemically is one. And you have literalists, because I've been diving into Hoven, and, and he's like a Genesis creationist, where it's mm-hmm. 100% literal, 6,000 years, and this is how he did it, which I understand that. But alchemists took it during the, the, the medieval times, and they were like, this is an encoded text. This is a magical text. The book of Genesis, for example, is showing you how to create another reality, right? The first chapters. And there was entire, like the, the Paracelsus, the famous uh, alchemist, he was writing commentary and they were going back and forth with the church as to like, hey, God created something out of nothing. I don't know. Well, he transmuted it. So they're like, they're, they're arguing about the, right? Getting lost in the sauce, arguing about the nitty gritty details. But I just want to say that we're interpreting it from, that these were real historically. These were real people. This is real stuff that they were using because you can have people, oh, those were allegories. Sure, that's another interpretation of it. You can look at it alchemically, like, you know, the pook stone and all that stuff we're going to talk about. So I just want to say that we're aware that there are other interpretations of these texts. You know, we yeah. get those people comments. It's your point. And this is just me plugging the new podcast that's going to be coming out called Free the Rabbits under Merkel Media. But one of the things I like to say is deeper like Bereans. So, I love the Berean standard version of the Bible. I think it's one of the best versions the Bible has been put out. I think they translate from the Koine Greek and the Hebrew the best, even better than the King James. I know it's blasphemy to some people, but I honestly believe it. I've compared it to the King James version where there's some verses will be com- almost completely different. And then I go look up the Hebrew or the Greek meaning of it. Like, no, that's right. Like that's pulled from the actual Hebrew or Greek words. Um, it's an amazing uh, version of scripture, but it's pulled from actually the Bereans or the inhabitants of Berea. And they're actually talked about in book of Acts chapter 17, verse 11. So Paul and Silas preached at Berea 
and they went to the inhabitants and they talked about him. They said that the the Bereans received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily where those things were so. So like the Bereans are known for going deep. Like they love to really go deep on what the actual meanings of the words mean. And you were just talking about that in, in being able to look at the scripture in a way that not only you're looking at it from a literal point of view, but also a metaphorical point of view too, and knowing how to know when that's happening Mm -hmm. because it's not always literal and it's not always metaphorical. Sometimes it can be both at the same time. Man, Jesus was was the master at like triple entendres. If you ever read some of the stuff he's saying, there's like five layers to it. He meant like five different things at once and it's like the most simple verse where it's seven words. Like, man, like I'll read it and I'm like, oh man, he's saying like, you know, five different things at once. So, and I think that's how we have to look at the Bible is in layers when you're looking at it, even when we're talking about, and we're going to go into tons of layers today with the story of David and Goliath, because there's a lot of it, but you got to start looking at the Bible that way that yes, it's literal, but it's also metaphorical. And sometimes it's at the same time and sometimes it's separate. Mm -hmm. And it's making me think of Philip K. Dick, where in the, the divine invasion, there is a Bible that they have. It's a holographic Bible. And they're able to lay the Bible out holographically, and they're able to stack it on top of each other. And they're able to see all these different connections. And they're able to essentially look within the text itself. And and I believe in the divine invasion, it's banned because they didn't want people to figure out these connections. So if you're able to imagine if you were able to lay the project outwards, the Bible, in some holographic weird, like in a room or something holographically and able to just lay it on top of each other and just really dig deeper into the text. I mean, that would be a game changer. So in this story, they're like, yeah, we need to ban that because we can't have people figuring out the truth. We're going to serve the truth to them. You know, we're going to, we're going to push our narrative. Mm. And I'm wondering, are the Bereans, is that, does that have anything to do with Hyperborea? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it could, it's I mean, it's very, there, bro. yeah, exactly. So it's very possible um, I plan on doing some deep dives on the actual Bereans because there's two different versions of the Bereans. You got the original Bereans from Acts, which were from Berea, but then you've got a group that came along in the 1770s uh, who called themselves the Bereans. They were trying to model themselves after the original Bereans. Uh, but the only issue I have with them, some of some of their theology, I personally don't buy. Like it, it's it's it's. It's not. Uh, it doesn't match up with exactly what the text says. Now, the Berean Standard Bible actually was pretty recently put together um, in the past, like you know, I think eight to ten years. So this was like guys that went out and were like, you know what, these versions of the Bible that are out there, they're not really pulling from the Hebrew and the Greek, you know, specifically. So they took all the versions of the Bible, they sat down with the actual text and put this together, which is fascinating to me, which I love seeing it in that way. And then when I personally go and match it up with the Hebrew and Greek, it literally lines up like Mm -hmm. way, way more uh, in tune with what those uh, versions are saying than any of the other versions out there, even the King James. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Keep it going. So we've got David showing up here. Um, All these men are scared. They're looking at Goliath. What's going on? And we're at verse... 24, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach, reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after the manner saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. So David's walking up, you know, he's actually supposed to be taking care of the, uh, you know, sheep or goats or whatever. And he walks up there. He ends up really pissing his brother off because his brother's part of these men. He's like, man, you need to get back to work. What are you doing? Because David's uh, a young shepherd boy. You know, he's not like a, 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 big brawny guy, like a grown man like that. He's, you know, young, but he in his, you know, uh, and probably good that he was naive. He's like, I don't understand why everybody's scared. Like, take this guy out. Like if God's with you, why are we not taking this guy out? So David offers to do it. 
he sees all these grown men scared, probably thousands at that, because you're looking yeah. at two, you know, warring factions lining up, probably opposite each other. And he decides that, you know, he's going to go do this. So he goes to Saul because Saul is got, he has to bless you to go do it. So Saul's the king at this point. So he goes to Saul and Saul is going to give him his armor to go out in. David doesn't have armor. He's not a soldier. So he goes to get his armor. And in the King James, it says, and Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass on his head. And he also armed him with a coat of mail. Verse 39, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, these, for I have not proved them, and David put them off him. So when I grew up, I always heard the story of this, and the story was David was a small, young shepherd boy. Saul gave him the armor. It couldn't fit. So David's like, I can't move around in these. We've even seen the little like uh, uh, depictions, yeah, drawings cartoons, as a kid yeah. where he's not fitting in it. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I can't do this or whatever. I don't think that's what happened. I actually don't think that's what happened at all. And the more that I dug into it, I, I realized that there's more going on here and, and really proves the power of God more when you understand the text. So I'm reading it in the Berean. Then Saul clothed David in his own tunic. So we're talking about a tunic, a shirt, like chainmail, tunic, whatever. So even if a shirt's a little big, it's not, it's not, it'd pale you like a giant set of armor, right? Mm. He did put a uh, bronze helmet on his head and then dressed him in armor. So we've got armor that comes on over the tunic. So we've got that disparity there a little bit. David strapped his sword over the tunic and tried to walk. Um, he was not accustomed to them. I cannot walk in these. I'm not accustomed to them. So David took them off. The accustomed, though, is not because it didn't fit. Now, we dig into what armor means in the Hebrew. It's madaw, M-A-D-D-A-W, which is also a derivative of mada, which is knowledge, thought, or science. Mm -hmm. So now we're starting to look at this armor a little differently. Was this a piece of technology? It gets even crazier. So we've got Shlomo Yitch, Yitchaki, who goes by Rashi, and he lived in, Fe he was born February 22nd of 1040. He was, he was a rabbi who studied the text deeply. He uh, went deep with, you know, uh, the Talmud, all that, all the uh, exegesis texts, like the, the deep studies of the Hebrew. And he said, and he was also said to be a descendant of King David. So this is after Jesus, we're like in 1040, he supposedly came from the line of David. So he had an investment to look into this a little, probably a little bit deeper than most people. So he comes out and he digging into the text. And he said that when David tried on Saul's armor, it miraculously changed size and fitted him rather than being too large. That's why in the text, when you read it in the Hebrew, it's saying that it fit on David. David's not saying that he doesn't want to wear the armor because it doesn't fit. He's saying, I haven't proved this armor. I don't know this armor. And God's more powerful than me putting on this piece of technology to go fight the giant, which is even crazier when you're digging into the fact that the armor fit. It was a magical, for lack of a better word, piece of armor that Saul gave him. Like, why wouldn't the king of Israel have a magical piece of armor? Of course he would back in those days. If it's available, he's got it. He's got it. <laughs> so he gives him that piece of armor, and David's like, no, nah, I don't want to wear it. That's bold, man. Yeah. That's some balls. He's like, no, I don't need it. I'm going to do what God wants me to do because God's telling me I don't need this armor to go face this giant. It's interesting because. You and I, have, we, we shared some notes, but not, not, not like a lot. And you're making me the the knowledge, right? So the other, you said the other word for it was knowledge or? or? Yes, knowledge, science were two words that that derivative of maddow, madda, because they both track as the same word, uh, means knowledge or science, which is crazy when you're looking at it in the Hebrew, here's this word for armor that actually means knowledge or science. That's wild because Solomon asked for what? Knowledge. knowledge so overall for over everything and king solomon is known as again tied to the freemasons tied to the templars tied to all these secret societies that see him as one of the greatest alchemists he was also mm. in my belief i think he was 
uh, messing around in other dimensions. He was also controlling demonic entities and doing all this other stuff. We'll, we'll get to that, but... Well, he used to trap them. Exactly. He used to trap them. And when he asked for with for God, you know, from God knowledge, maybe he was asking God for some piece of technology and not, you know, at, it says knowledge, but it actually means something else. So I'm wondering, I don't know if you looked into what, when Solomon asked for the knowledge of all animals and plants, you have the mineral and the animal kingdom in there as well, which is part of alchemy. So, and mind you that King David, which we'll eventually get into it. I see it there, stones. He passed down the pook stone to Solomon. Not the poop stone. No, no. Pook. It's P-U-K, but yeah. it's pronounced pook. Pook. I nipped that right in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the pook stone. So we always say, what the pook is going on? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm just making all these connections and yeah, we'll get into it, bro. Yeah. So now we're to the point where David's like, I don't need this piece of technology. We're, we're looking at it in the Hebrew in the text and we're looking at Rabbi Rashi who is supposedly from the bloodline of David, who's done the deep dives in the Talmud to say, no, it's basically saying it fit. That's a misrepresentation for what that means. Um, you know, in the King James, it says it wasn't proved. Never said it didn't fit. He just didn't prove it. He didn't approve it is basically what that means. Mm. So David's like, okay, I'm going to go and get these stones. Um, God's telling him to go do it. So he takes his staff in his hand. This is verse 40. And shows him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So here in this verse, the word stone is abonim in the Hebrew. It happens 41 occurrences in the Bible. And it just means stone. Just means stone. It doesn't sound exciting for everybody listening yet. But in this verse, it just means stone. That's it. It's just a stone. And that's where we're going to go with that. So verse 41, and the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bared the shield went before him. Verse 42, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth, ruddy and fair of countenance. So I've heard some theologians try to make the, because they've done the deep dives and they realized that the armor fit from earlier. They've tried to, I've actually read some crazy studies where they thought that David was actually grown and he could fit the armor is why that Saul wouldn't have given him armor if it didn't, if he didn't think that it fit. I don't agree with that. We're looking dead on the verse where he said he was but a youth, ruddy and fair of countenance. So he's definitely not a grown man. And mm -hmm. Saul was also involved with some occultic people too. Absolutely. Which so, we're going to get into It's not just Saul. some regular guy that's like, hey, yes, I'm. I'm royalty. Here's this regular armor. You know, he's messing around with some people who had some otherworldly knowledge that he was involved in. So that he was involved with, and which is an important thing to also point out. So he could have given him some weird. And that's what I love about the Bible. It's such a great, there's so many crazy stories within it. And it's a lot more interesting than people give it credit to be. And here you are, you can literally extract hours and hours of information from just these simple lines of text you know what i'm saying like you're, you're painting a whole different story it's almost like a like a like a sci-fi epic right it was like what's next lightsabers like well <laughs> we're getting there yeah we're, we're getting, getting there. that's next <laughs> yeah so uh verse 43 and the philistine said unto david am i a dog that thou comes to me with staves or sticks and the philistine cursed david by his gods so he's basically like looking man what are you coming like because he's walking up with a staff we heard it earlier in the text so he all he sees is the staff right now he's probably not paying attention to the rock and the, and the sling and all that um then david said the philistine now comes to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield but i come to thee, thee in the name of the lord of hosts the god of the armies of israel who now has to fight so david's pretty confident at this point when picked up some Real confident. He just turned down some mythical, magical armor that he could have worn that technology, however you want to say it, alchemically fit him perfectly that wasn't supposed to, just shrunk down to fit his size. And he said, nah, I don't need this. It's, it's wild to think about. To me, that makes it even crazier to yeah. me. The fact that he had some piece of technology that- Because it, if this is real, like how many people would be like, thanks. You right. Know? Like, and he's like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. So this That's is wild. where it's going to get really, really interesting. And I know that Juan's going to go on some crazy tangents here, which I'm going to love. And this is where I'm the up. stone I'm ready, bro. I'm queued up. The stone comes into place. So verse 49, 
And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead the st- that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. The word for stone in the Hebrew there is different. Then, Abinim then was, what was, was when earlier. Up. When he mm-hmm. picked it up, it just meant stone. Now it's Eben, E-B-E-N. And this is a host of different meanings that Eben can have. Eben breaks down into sapphire, which people derive from the word sapphire. One of the, one of the main structured meanings that it means is consecrated. This was a consecrated stone at this point. This stone was in, imbued with power from God. Mm-hmm. It was transmuted. Or uh, now chemical words, transmuted, it changed in that moment, whether he pulled it from the brook and it changed when he had it or however, but it morphed, it changed into something different. This is in the Hebrew. The stone is different now. It's not the same stone. It's a completely different object at this point. Which goes back to this idea of rejection of what the king gave him, you know, and whether he knew that or not. It, 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 sh- it let's just say he didn't know. It shows uh, in that moment so much faith on his part that God's got him, and then to see that as how you're you're talking about it, it's like the stone. It, it's like God. It makes me wonder. This is what I'm trying to say. It makes me wonder what could have happened if he said thanks, because because him walking on that faith then allowed God to flex and say. You didn't need that because watch what I do. Whether when 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 he picked it up or if it's in midair and and you know I'm just, in my cartoon mind I'm thinking Zeus going zap and it's just like all of a sudden it changes and it's like a boulder <laughs> and it smacks in the face. The rejected stone becomes the cornerstone. Cornerstone, mm-hmm. which we're going to get into those verses today too. And though and that cornerstone is also Eben. It also stands for Eben. That stone in the cornerstone is Eben. And I'm about to throw you the the, the baton hardcore here. The oop to the layup. The Eben also stands for the firestone. It is also worded as the firestone, which in Ezekiel 28, 14, and 16 speaks of, you were anointed as the guardian chair before I had ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the firestone. He's talking about Lucifer. This is before he got kicked out. By the vastness of your trade, that's when he was trading with people in old earth, and I've done an episode on that already. You were filled with violence and you sinned, so I just drove you in disgrace from the mountain of God, and I banished you, O guardian cherub, from among the firestones. It's the same stone that David now has in his sling. It's the same word. It's the He's got a firestone with him. And what is that firestone? What is that regular stone? Abinim changed to Eben to this firestone, this consecrated firestone that he took David, Goliath out with. And by the, by, by the way, there is thought that Nephilim, and people will understand this uh, terminology in uh, different occultic realms, the third eye or the pineal gland, which I think we all have. And I think they try to dumb us away from that. But the pineal gland, it said that Nephilim used that as a psionic weapon to where they could disrupt your brain when you're in battle to where you don't know where you're at and you feel like you're losing your mind. They're able to do that because they could psychically knock you out almost like with a psychic bomb. Where did he hit him? In the middle of his forehead where the pineal glands out till it sunk into his head. How was a regular stone sinking into his head? It wasn't a regular stone anymore. It was a fire stone. It was something completely different. It transmuted into this whole other thing. That's why he didn't wear the armor. Wow. Yeah. You, wow. You answered my question. I was going to ask you if, if it says exactly where it hit him because it hit him where the third eye is, essentially. Yes. Yeah. And it's interesting because, right, we talk about, and you guys are in for a treat, not a lot of people know this about me. But I was actually raised Pentecostal Christian. You said that on my show already. Everybody knows that. All right. <laughs> Anyways, I don't talk about it a lot. But an interesting part of it, because I've always talked about this, where when the Holy Spirit is in the house, you can feel it, right? It's like it's, a, it's in the air. It's something about it. And it's interesting because Paracelsus talked about the Holy Spirit perhaps being that prima materia that helped God. Because right uh, in the Gospel of John, he talks about he was with God at the beginning. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit being present when everything is being created 
And if, let's say that Genesis is for a second alchemical, and it's about the creation of a universe, the creation of an of a uh, minutus mundus is what they call it, a small world essentially. And that God, the, the Holy Spirit was there. Well, the Holy Spirit, Paracelsus argued that that was the prima materia, which the prima materia is something that you need in order to achieve the magnum opus. And one of the magnum opi is the philosopher's stone, the fire stone, where you have the red stone and you have the white stone. One is used to make gold. The other one's used to make silver. And there's various things you can do, but think about that, right? If the Holy Spirit helped David out, let's say as soon as he slung it, he was able to conduct this transmutation through the use of the Holy Spirit because God was there to help him. It would make sense that as soon as it was going to hit him, maybe it did blow up, right? And, and, it, and it like doubled in size How or whatever cool would that, be? Yeah, that would be dope but <laughs> I, I would but that would you think if that actually happened though it would have made the text right like like there's, yeah. it, it became a boulder and smashed his, his head, head off, off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it took his head off but think about it because we're talking about the nephilim and all that stuff and if we follow the lineage back the knowledge of alchemy came from the nephilim and i'm just thinking outside the box here where let's say the nephilim did teach this too right and we know that the uh, noah and his lineage was involved with alchemy and all this stuff. And that's why they were able to live for so long because they, they had the elixir of life. Let's say that they also used that tech, even if it came from Nephilim, which are darker entities, demonic in nature. Who's to say that the good guys weren't also using that technology for their own purposes? I've always argued that Adam and his lineage always already had this version of technology that what the fallen entities taught and what the Nephilim taught was the corruption of the original mm -hmm. connection so like that we had with like God. A like a repackaging of Absolutely. something Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, when they hear the word alchemy, they automatically think bad things. Yeah. They automatically think occult and they think that it's something. I don't necessarily use it that way because to me it's just an overarching term it's the manipulation of matter and reality itself. right that's the way i see which it. i think that the guys of old methuselah noah adam all all these guys could use that they knew how to i mean we even know from the book of jubilees and this is one of the apocryphal books that when adam sinned that god cut off the mouths of the animal kind and anything that Adam could talk to anymore. I don't think it was necessarily them using their mouths to talk. I think it was a, a telepathy that was cut off at that point where we were no longer able to have those conversations with animal kind anymore. Think about whales. You know, whales have one of the most extensive vernaculars in the world. They have, they have a, a bigger uh, lexicon than we do. Bro, that's why. And, I, and somebody told me this on my show. I don't know if it was Justin from Cryptos of the Corn, but there was somebody on my show that told me. Or what show? Cryptos of the Corn. Okay. It, it, it could have been after the, the fact, or maybe it was a private conversation, where the first animals created in Genesis were the whales, depending on which translation you read. Mm. Okay, and that's interesting because it connects to a whole bunch of other stuff. But you're talking about whales. They just recently came out with some AI that... that you can talk to whales telepathically thousands of miles away. And it's interesting that in the movie Avatar, they were doing what to the whales? They were extracting this sort of elixir of life thing where it would extend people's lives and it was worth a crazy amount of money. They were extracting it from the whales? From the whale's brain. Have you ever watched the new Avatar? No. Right, anyway. I, I just, listen. So, <laughs> spoiler no, for those people. Movies. The What's whales. The movie? The whales in that movie have their own religion, their own philosophy, and they talk and they're like super spiritual creatures. And I'm like, these people are reading these texts. They're reading the same thing that we're reading because yeah. like in the first animals that God made were the whales. And when you look at the Bible, like for me, and look at all these names for the philosophers, so there's like at least 15 names for the philosophers. It's got a whole bunch of names. The it, To me, when when I got into this sort of realm of of topics i'm like where can i find where can i connect alchemy in the in the bible like re religiously right because it doesn't take away from the bible it doesn't it doesn't mean anything it's just another layer for you to be able to look at the bible so when i first i googled like out of nowhere i'm like alchemy in the bible and then i came across uh, Raphael patai hopefully i'm saying it right one of his article biblical figures 
biblical figures as alchemists. And I'm reading this, this journal, this paper, and it's blowing me away because then I'm able to take that as a base and then go deeper. I was telling you like, how about this guy, Job, alchemist, you know, a Gideon, alchemist, like all these guys, and then come to find out. I'm translating other texts where it's like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of commentaries on the book of Genesis. And I was like, well, why is that? Well, because they thought it was about creating a different reality. And I'm like, the Bible, I think, has been stripped away from a lot of the esoteric and occult knowledge and not the bad occult stuff. And I think it's done on purpose because the powers that be don't want us to have access to a lot of these this technology. The that, supernatural has been ripped away from the Bible. Yeah. And you and I talk yeah. about that all the time, Tony. And I think that was designed by the church when they first got in there because once they taught people that they had to go through people to get to God. To brokerage. Even trips. if it's a brokerage of what the text means. Think about this. You know, there will be people that listen to this episode and instantly get angry. And you know why they'll get angry? Because somebody on a pulpit or somebody told them what the text meant. They didn't look into it for themselves. You know, I'm not, we're not even saying that this is it. We're just saying this is a idea of what these texts could mean because thinking about the text because of the actual translations of these texts and the deeper meaning of it. Also, when you said occult for the people out there, occult just means hidden, by the way. It doesn't mean a negative thing necessarily. We do use it as a negative call thing. Me a Satanist, probably. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> probably probably there'll be a comment or two in there yeah, it happens yeah it happens <laughs> but i know joel's in the zone when when you start seeing that vein right here, oh yeah start and, to and, pop out so it's it's like when when this vein starts popping he's hitting the zone when he's at the, the tip of the zone the vein right here starts popping <laughs> and that that one stays until he's done and oh, so like okay. so he's not done yet so you like, you just let him rock <laughs> all right cool yeah i'm using that as like anything i'm like oh it's starting down here and it's like boom and then it comes back all right i'm good i, I call it the joel meter Okay, okay, cool. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, so, we were talking about the cornerstone. You brought that up. Mm -hmm. And we know that in the Bible, from a metaphorical angle, that the cornerstone represents Jesus. He's the cornerstone of the church. He's the cornerstone of our beliefs. It's what Yeshua was put here on this earth to do. By the way, we talked about this earlier. He came through the bloodline of David. So you've got this, you know shepherd boy who's going out here fighting this giant with the power of God um, at the time he probably didn't even know his bloodline was going to have yeah. Jesus come out of it but these, these are these strong characters that were the precursors to Jesus Christ coming to us but Psalm uh, 118 22 the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone again the stone is ebon the fire stone it represents this a uh, powerful consecrated stone. So when they're talking about Yeshua and Jesus, he's represented as that. He is the the power stone, or like you like to say, the philosopher's stone. Mm -hmm. He is the essence of what this entire universe or multiverse is for people that like to go down that road is built on. It is. He is the essence of it, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. It's all that. And it says it in the text. But you can go deeper because there's tons of verses that talk about the cornerstone. Uh, we know that first Peter 2, 7 through 8, which we talked about earlier, Peter means stone, which that's another one for you. Um, because and he was Jesus's you know, favorite, basically. Yeah. Like that was, that was, you know, Jesus's guy was Peter. And Peter was probably one of the most rugged, uh, ridiculous disciples of Jesus. He denied him three times. He's chopping dude's ears off. He's a wild dude. Like, you know I what I mean? I'll die for you. Would you? And then Jesus was like, would you really? <laughs> right. <laughs> you right. sure about that? You sure about that? <laughs> so this though is in the New Testament. So the stone is going to come from a different word, lithos. In the Koine Greek, which means substance. So now we're still going to this changing, this firestone, this powerful substance. It's representation of Jesus, what Jesus is. That's what, if you want to say that the bloodline of Yeshua always had metaphorical instances that represented Jesus, what better than David with a transmutated firestone that represented the very essence of Jesus? Well, it's it's interesting because again, wow, I wore this shirt for a reason. Okay, I'm not saying it's homunculus, but there's a good <laughs> chance it might be homunculus. Just check this out. One of the things about the substance, I'm just thinking about Simon Magus, who's like, "Listen, guys, I want some of whatever you got. Let me buy it off of you." And maybe Simon Magus thought that the Holy Spirit or whatever it was was a sort of substance, and that maybe these guys were running around in some circles that had access to technology or something, 
And maybe that's where that comes from because Simon Magus, right? The father of all heresies where we get magician, MAGA, all that stuff from that, right? Whoops. MAGA means witch in Latin. Uh, so again, just be weary of, of where you get your information from because you know, we're, we're taking these letters and these words from people who we think have the best intentions and sometimes they don't. Uh, but yeah, the substance was an interesting one because the substance is another word that I've seen used for homunculus and also Solomon Shamir, mm. which is a allegedly a little worm that he used to construct the temple of Solomon. Shamir? The Shamir. Yeah. And I did a whole... Th- when you're looking at so many different pieces of art and just reading, you you start to look at these different plates and they start to look like other things. And I remember I, just to troll the internet, I I put out a meme when that whole Titan thing popped off with the submarine that sunk in it right to the Titanic. Mm-hmm. And that Titan submarine looked just like a, a Shamir. And it's a little worm that it's either referred to as a little worm or substance that Solomon used to, to create his temple. And when I put that meme out, it, it kind of took off. And I even did an episode with Tripoli on it, on Tinfoil Hat, where when you start to link all the people within that vessel, right? Another word for a boat or submarine or something. It's, it, bro, it unraveled. Like the, one of the guy's name was Solomon. The other guy's name was, it was Suleiman, Solomon. His, uh, I broke it down, but it looked exactly like the Shamir, the submarine looked like the so Shamir. What do you think, like when it comes to that, do you think that um, that was intentional or that was that like um, Cosmos destiny? I think that certain groups of occultists, they practice things out. So they have all these mythos. And when you're able to, it goes back into that writing. So when you have William Shakespeare, who the world's a stage, when it goes from different mediums, from writing to pictures, which is more powerful than writing because people remember pictures more. From that, it goes into, you got music. Lucifer is allegedly the, the creator of music. You have all that connection there. You go to movies. And then you can, if you look at a movie, it's a lot more powerful. So what I believe they're doing is, again, through the use, the the homunculus also plays into that. Because imagine if you're able to play this occult ritual in the real world, whatever that is, in reality, and act out your entire mythos or whatever saga you want to follow, whatever mythology, cosmology you want to follow in the real world. Like we have stories of, right? David and Goliath and all the Lucifer and God, whatever it is, if you're able to somehow play out your mythology, you're able to extract some power or transmute some energy from that and use it in the world, in the, in the, the world of stage type of thing. It's hard to explain, but essentially it's about the manipulation of energies and being able to take that and use it for something else. So I do believe it was some sort of play acting out that they were aware of. I mean, the victims of it, the guys who died. No, whoever illustrate, whoever uh, orchestrated it, because the guy that was the CEO of that company was uh, a member of the Bohemian Grove. And his dad was like the president-elect at one time of Bohemian Grove. So hmm. what are the chances of that happening, that they're hanging around with Donald Rumfeld and all these guys that, that are elite, yeah. right? So who's to say maybe it was some sort of sacrifice? And who's to say that it was actually a sacrifice at all? What if what they're showing us is the wreckage was never the wreckage? What if, and this is to play into, you talked about Avatar earlier, and a lot of these elites are actually uh, submarine pilots. James Cameron, who created Avatar, is a submarine pilot. Ghislaine Maxwell is a submarine pilot. They're all submarine pilots. What are they going under the earth or under the water to find and where are they going? That's what you got to start thinking about. What are these elites are obsessed with under the water for? What's going on under the water? Look at Tony. We know what's going on under the water. Bro. <laughs> we know. And that's, we got to get a sub, ourselves a submarine. Pilot. No, we're not getting a submarine. <laughs> yeah. bro. You know, I'm down. Oh, he's down. I'm I going am. down with him. <laughs> I'm not. So, you, hey, listen, when we don't come back, the show must carry on. Move up here. I need you to fill in for us. <laughs> I'll let the wife know. All right. Oh gosh. <laughs> Dude, so I, so, I'm gonna. All right, so I'm I'm working on things, and I'm gonna add to the list of things I need to work on. I need to I need to learn how to do these sub I, the submarines. I need I need to learn how to pilot them. Yeah, the I pilot think license. that like the the Meg, 
that sort of thing where at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, just like another dimension. And there's a reason why Ghislaine and all these other characters associated with her where she was training other elites. A lot of elites have uh, licenses to pilot submarines. And I think that it's not about space. I think it's about whatever yeah. is down at the bottom yeah. of our oceans. And look at the Pacific Rim. There's these entities coming through this portal at the, the bottom. The kaiju. The kaiju and all that stuff. And if you look, again, the Avatar, what the Avatar represents, by the way, the Avatar are homunculi. It literally says it in the plot of the movie. They're artificially created to host the consciousness of these people. Look at what Elon Musk and all these guys are doing. They literally just posted a news article about the first human trials coming out with the Neuralink. Mm -hmm. You can't. All the movies that we've ever seen about the Terminator and technology mm -hmm. always end bad. <laughs> Frankenstein was the first story about the, the technology betraying you. And here these people are. But again, it's about, it's about quenching the thirst of that Faustian complex that we all have, right? About wanting to learn everything and anything, no matter the cost. Mm -hmm. So these people, what's next? It's like, well, you might lose you know, your spirit, if you take on, if, if you plug the Neuralink in, would you do it? Heck no. But you're going to be able to, but you're going to be able to use your phone. I don't care. Without touching it. Dude. No, man. You're talking to somebody who'd rather be a farmer than a podcaster half the time. Like, <laughs> Maybe, okay. Joel, <laughs> would you do it, bro? No. But some people would say yes. I get why you're asking the question because you're saying it from an angle of the average person if you sell them on how it will help advance them. A great show right, is so, Black uh, Mirror. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say, you guys talk a lot. Let me talk about this one, right? I was just the same thing. Let me feel like, like what a perfect example of that is if you offer somebody the ability to transfer their consciousness and maybe even their soul or their spirit into a digital world where they'll never die, will they say yes? Because they don't have to face the consequences then of facing their maker because they never will get to that point. They'll live on forever within this artificial realm. Is that what you're going to say? Probably not. Sort of. But I was going into the whole Black Mirror thing when they put the chips in and mm -hmm. basically everything. They could even rewind their past. Yep. But then like certain parts of their past they could erase if they didn't want to see like somebody yeah. that hurt them or whatever else. That That's shows. what they're going to offer. Yeah. Their shows, but they're based on future reality. Yeah. yeah. And when, when Black Mirror first came out, when th th this was, I don't know, going on eight years ago, mm -hmm. seven, eight years ago. Yeah, uh I remember the very first episode I saw. It might be the first episode they ever came out with, which was uh, um, the the lady with this social credit system mm -hmm. and how that all broke down and stuff. I remember sitting on the couch looking at Lindsay. I'm like, "That's real. Like that that can happen." And I know the the, the shows created to make the viewer feel like to walk you through the steps of how this actually happened in in the real world. But like, dude, like we were we were knocking on that door, and that that TV show. That's on another level. That TV show. Do they still make it? Yeah. yeah. They just came out with a new season not too long ago. Really? Yeah. I got yeah, where they go even deeper on like the layers of reality and like the source reality, which is crazy because one of the big things that we always talk about is like interdimensionalism and being able to access other realities. Well, simulation. What if this reality isn't even the one? I mean, you had the Gnostics talking about that. Like, yo, this is a fake reality. There, everybody was like, what are you guys even talking about? I was like, no, we've been trapped. And then those people got wiped out. I don't know. Which usually, is, usually when the people who are spitting some sort of truth, those are usually the guys that go first. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Usually, the people who have we're talking about knowledge that you're not supposed to have. What if? I'm just saying. What if they they were in touch with something beyond them, and that links into the all the alchemists and everything, and why even they were wiped out because the Philip K. Dick talks about that the that the Gnostics were at this border of human evolution, that they were the reason that they were experimenting with the elixirs of life. And there's stories about these alchemists taking these elixirs or, or giving them to, to other people. So entire royalty would have court of alchemists working 24 hours a day, trying to create the philosopher's stone, trying to create the elixir of life. There's a reason why at the terracotta warriors, the, the, the whole army, there's a pool of mercury there. Mercury was very important because they were, there were stories about alchemists taking these elixirs, their nails, teeth, hair, everything falling off, and they were being rejuvenated, right? But you can also take that, and what have you taken? You turn into a dogman 
or or a Bigfoot or whatever, anything else, like something otherworldly, which I also think was also happening in, in that Rothschild Canticles, I read somewhere where it was also how to create monstrous races. And, I, and it could be there. I, I have to double check. Don't quote me on that. But I think that uh, that also plays a part to it. So if the elites are interested in this, and by the elites, we're talking about the major powers. You have very wealthy people, uh, Jeff Bezos, looking for the elixir of life. You know, and there, that, that was an article like a year ago or something like that. They're, they're in the know. You know, they, 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 even if they're not directly reading these, the, these texts, they have people who are reading it for them. And mm-hmm. they're like, uh, just tell me what I got to do, bro. Yeah, it's kind of like you're talking about the court of alchemists. They have their own court of alchemists. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, they got guys working for them 24-7 to get to that point. To quote a Freemason, and I'm not a Freemason, so just to quote uh, one of these things that Manly P. Hall says is that the alchemist, he's instead of having these rows, right, with the, with the hood and being in a cave, he says that the alchemist is his, his clothing is replaced by a white lab coat and four walls. So I don't think that that anything has really changed. It's just the setting that's mm-hmm. changed. The times have changed and things have gotten yeah. more I mean, advanced. What you're describing is stuff exactly what I was thinking with the whole uh Hitler Nazi thing. Like it's it's yes. become so well known of what he was doing and people are like, "Can you imagine a leader of, you know, was was planning this and doing this? It's crazy. It's so out there. It's so wild. It's so rare in reality. This has been happening far longer than Hitler." And it's just there, like you were talking about earlier about how certain structures of organizations will piece out the information that they want you to have. Mm-hmm. I forget what example was meaning. It may have been the church that we were talking about. Like that's the classic example of that is that th- these are historical things that have been happening for such a long time, but they're only giving us the Nazi stuff. That's the trigger. And, yeah. the, 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 and that, the, and that makes you so, occult. and as, the, as, as a human being, maybe it makes you so consciously uncomfortable that it's, it becomes the wall that you can't see past in the timeline to see all the other times that it's happened. Does that right. make sense? Did you just say that they psyoped everybody? Is that what you just said? That they're, they're... I didn't say the, the word that's going to get this channel banned now until you... No, I'm just kidding. So, no, so, so no, but you're right. It's like the truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. Right? So focus on all this other negative yeah. stuff. Focus on all the other stuff that they did to those certain people, right? I'm not going to say it. But, and ignore all the other stuff that they were doing where they were trying to going to hollow earth and, and all this mm-hmm. other crazy technology. They had entire, I think they had witches and everything, the Vril right. and all that stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. that's part of, some people say that's a conspiracy, but I, I believe otherwise. Well, and to your point too, Tony, and Juan and I talk about this a lot because there are, there's a section of people who really don't like it when you start talking about the fantastical aspects. It's like, oh, that the aliens and, and, and Nephilim, and that's a distraction, distraction from, from what's really going on in the world. What you need to start understanding is it's all connected. So the wild, crazy stuff is connected to that geopolitical side that you mm-hmm. keep talking about, too, because those guys believe in it more than you do. Yeah. They're acting on it, and they're doing it. You just talked about Jeff Bezos looking for the elixir of life. You got these guys who have a lot of money, a lot of power, and they believe in this stuff. They believe in the occult. They are acting it out, and they're not acting out because they don't think it works. They've seen it work. Yeah. So that is a fact. So if you want to talk about what, these aliens might be or what these Nephilim might be and there might be a ton of different answers but to negate it and say mm. it doesn't exist it, it's it's absolutely not there is to negate the fact that people in power believe it the people that you want to follow believe it right you know mm. like the people that you want to believe believe it but you don't want to believe it because they're telling you not to believe it yeah, right exactly. right exactly. That, that, that's exactly wild how- and it goes to what you said about the Bible early on, and I think this happened, you know, after Jesus left the earth and when the Roman Catholic Church came in and you saw a lot of those structures start being added. You saw a lot of guys fighting over what Bro, the scriptures meant. Freemasons edited the King James Version of the Bible. That you know is saying? a rabbit like, hole to go that, down that, to. That's, that's, if you want to, well, for some people, mainstream history is fake as well, but that's history right there. That's history 101. You know, I'm saying that one of the first, one of the guys to to establish Freemasonry, you got Francis Bacon in there, edited the King James Version of the Bible. So, so what was taken out or what was injected, right? That, what is it, lot. the Geneva Bible? Is that, is that I, I always... Those I, were the two. We were talking about this last night. Right. We were talking about the fight over mm-hmm. the Geneva Bible and the fight over the King James Bible. Yeah. I mean, if you know anything about King James, he wasn't a good person at all. Like he yeah. was pretty, nope. pretty wicked. Some of the things that they took out of there was clearly just because he wanted to 
establish control. I forget the verses and stuff, but they talked about like, um, it was referencing the government and how uh, we, we it, like in the it, in the Geneva, it was referencing how, uh, ah, man, I'm, I'm going to butcher this. So I'm just going to let it go. But it was, it was referencing the government and he was like, no, I don't want that in there. Because then they're, it's going to give them license to right. not follow what I say, but what God's saying. Well, right. Let's talk about the demonology that King James was also writing about. So speaking on the fact that you're saying that, oh, we we can't believe the supernatural. Well, you had entire guys writing books on demonology. King James was one of the first guys to write about demon, but writing about demons, witches, vampires, all co- co- uh, kind of crazy stuff. You can read for you can Google this right now. You can pull it up, and this is the guy that was response for the 1611 King James version of the Bible. Mm. Okay. And again, I'm not saying that God doesn't inspire things and gives messages to and people. And control it anyway. I it think could, that's yeah. one thing that, why don't I go back and forth on this? So well, I consult with you a lot because you know a lot more about the, the Bible King James I version. Him, like, I, I am not against the King James version at all. And I use it for a lot of things. And I do think that God, even through evil, can always push his narrative through regardless. Now, when I'm digging into the deeper meanings of these texts, I do like the Brian Standard a lot, and I'll speak on that a lot just to people because I like going to the actual meanings of these words. Because listen, a lot of this supernatural stuff was taken out. And take the evil message of King James and some of those guys out of it. Some guys like switched things or didn't uh, translate things in the Bible. One, they didn't have a translation for it. Two, they didn't want to scare people because they were like, man, we start talking about giants and putting all this crazy stuff in here. It might scare them off to where they don't want to read the Bible. And that's man, right? But I do think that God influences what he wants to get out. So I want to put that out there too. So again, it's, it's a, It's a crazy road to dig into that. And he and I love talking about the King James Bible and what that really means. Um, But even to get to that Hebrew part, to technology, we're talking about the, the, the deeper meaning of the text. We're talking about Saul's armor. Well, let's talk about Goliath's. Let's talk about what Goliath had on the battlefield. We didn't get to the sword. We didn't get to... Lightsaber. The piece of technology that Goliath had on him. So in verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Now remember, when David walked out on that battlefield and looked at Goliath, what did he tell him? Your head is mine, literally. I'm going to cut your head off. That's crazy. He didn't have any, he didn't have a sword on him. He told Goliath, your head is mine. He walks over to Goliath, a young shepherd boy walks over to Goliath. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him, cut off his head therewith, and when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Okay, let's really think about this. This young, small shepherd boy tells a giant before he hits him with a consecrated firestone, To go inside of his head. This is scripturally inside of his head. Goes through his head. He tells him, your head's mine. I'm cutting it off here today. Tells him that. With what sword? How did he know? Then he goes over and picks up a giant sword? A Nephilim sword? A small shepherd boy? Wait a minute. What what kind of sword was this? We got to start looking at the text. So the Hebrew word for sword here is harab. And it also attributes that same word to the flaming swords Mm. of the Garden of Eden and the cherubs held, and also the sword of Yahweh worked at as an instrument of his judgment. So we're already attributing this word to angelic technology. Some sort of angelic technology, Nephilim technology that Goliath had, but it still doesn't explain how David was able to wield it, right? We don't really understand that, but... We start digging into the Midrash, and the Midrash is an expansive Jewish biblical study using a rabbinic mode of interpretation prominent in the Talmud. So these rabbis would go into the Talmud, they would you know, look, look at these meanings of these Hebrew words and figure out, okay, what does this really mean? Like it, They're digging. They're, they're looking for the knowledge within the text. They want to see what's there that no one else is seeing. And according to the Midrash, Goliath's sword had magical powers. It is believed that it was able to change size and weight to match the owner. So this angelic technology, anyone, whoever wielded it, 
it would change to fit. That was their finding. Yes, their so finding. This isn't. This isn't you finding it in like meaning of the words. These the are text. rabbis is, that dug finding, forever. They, this is published. This is published in the up. Talmud. Yes, in the Midrash, which is in a study wow. and exegesis of the Talmud of this text. They're saying that yes, Goliath's sword had magical powers. It could change the size and weight to match the owner. When David picked it up. He knew it was a piece of technology. It morphed to him in his size, and he cut his head off. Jeez. You think the Smithsonian or the Vatican has that skull somewhere, like hidden away? It, it's possible. It's possible. But we're looking at the Midrash. But I've got biblical, biblical verses that will back this up later on in the text. So. Go ahead. No, just keep going. Keep going. I, we we need we need to to finish what you're saying because I don't want you forgetting. And then we gotta take a bathroom break because I gotta go to the bathroom so bad I can taste it. So you okay, drink these. I things, know. Bro. So David, after he kills Goliath, at some point in between these ver- in between you know in, in First Samuel. Saul is gets jealous. We all know this. Saul knows that the kingdom wants David to be king. This shepherd boy went out here and slaughtered this Nephilim with a firestone and then chopped his head off with an angelic piece of technology that morphed to him. After he told Saul, I don't need your technology because God's going to find a way. Pure insanity when you think about I mean, I just think about having that kind of like bravery. Like, no, like that kind of faith. I yeah. Mean, so, like the the interpretation that I've always um, gone with with that story is the fact that this dude. Because all right, so years ago, somebody challenged me on the story of David and Goliath, and they said that clearly David didn't have faith that God would come through for him because he picked up five stones when he could have just picked up one to do the job. <laughs> And I was like, this is so stupid. And 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 I, I kind of wrote this whole thing down. But um, the fact that, that he had, like, so on my thought process of the faith aspect, like the fact that he had that much faith that he's like, no, I don't need that technology because that's not going to compare to what you're about to see. Right. Like, and he does, he like, the, nowhere in the scripture does it say that David knew what was going to happen. Right. He had the faith that he, it, through faith, he knew whatever was being offered to him was not the, was not it. Right. And that's crazy. That's wild. And it gets, and it gets crazier because you're now seeing Saul, who's angry at David. David goes on the run. He has to hide from Saul. So this is a point where, you know, David goes through some questioning, like, God, why are you putting me through this? You know, he wouldn't have had a hide from Saul. He would have taken that magical cloak to begin with. You know, right? You'd be like, I got you. No, I'm not worried about you. So he's running from Saul. David goes to the town of Nob, where he visits with a priest named Ahimelech. David tells him that he has an urgent mission from the king and needed bread and weapons. So he kind of like lies to Ahimelech and is like, "Listen, I got to come here. I got to get some stuff." And people revere David. I mean, come on, like, look what he did. So the priest tells him that the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the Valley of Elah, is here, wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. And the ephod is those like yellow aprons that you'll see the high priest wear in Judaism. And he said, if you want it, take it for yourself, then take it. So he tells David to come get the sword of Goliath. So they're keeping it in a sacred, holy place, this sword of Goliath. So that's already telling, like, and, and people could argue that it was just a, you know, an homage to what happened. That doesn't seem, as you're reading through the text later, on what that really means. This is good. First Samuel 21, 9, the priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elis, here is wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. If you want, you may take it, for there is no other but this one. So he said, there's no other weapons there. So that's telling. They don't keep anything else there but this sword. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. So there's nothing like it. There's no other sword like it. It's not a sword. It's a piece of technology that they left, that they kept, that these, all of these priests 
that worked in that worked in this temple in Nod kept. They allowed David to come get it, but David wanted that sword. I need that sword because if I'm on the run and st- and people are coming at me, I want this piece of technology because this piece of technology will allow me to be able to fight off your little puny swords. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to get to the part where they go and ransack the tech of the other Nephilim? Where they go and find his brothers and also take their technology? So that is funny. And I've actually talked about that before on this show. But oh, that, no, no. that breaks down later to when David becomes king. And then he and the mighty men go to hunting Goliath's siblings in the mountains. And uh, good, good you're people? actually talking about 2 Samuel 21, 16. Uh, and Ish by Benob, which was one of his brothers, which was the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight. He being girded with a new sword, a new as a day say, that means a new, but there's no word for sword there. They supplemented that word, that Hebrew word, which we don't even know what that Hebrew word means. It was a piece of technology. You know, I've talked about this before, okay. but that is a throw. That's a, a late, that's a throwback to this, what we just talked about. This piece of technology that Goliath had. So we know that these Nephilim were working with crazy alchemical technology that their fathers gave them, that taught them this technology that David was able to wield. That's wild. All right. So listen, Jack, how long have we been going? Hour and 24. This is a good spot where we're going to take a break. We're going to take a bathroom break. And when we come back in, it's going to be an overtime and we're going to move okay. into overtime and uh, take this conversation to other directions and uh, have some fun with it. Yeah. Sounds good. Great. All right. Everybody listening. Thank you very much for tuning into the show. You guys are awesome. And until next week, you guys, anything you want to say before we get out of here? I am. So speaking of interdimensional, I know you plugged your podcast that's coming up here soon. A new show. I also have a, well, speaking of homunculi, cause you talked about, uh, Goliath carrying a homunculus on his back. Well, in my comic book, The Chosen Juan, issue two, which if I get this out, I'm able to pump out other issues, get Merkel in there, get Joel in there, get a whole bunch of people in there. In issue two, Tripoli actually has uh, Johnny and XG on his back as as homunculi. So it's Tripoli <laughs> carrying them on his back and their little homunculi on his back. And you can go to chosenjuan.com, sign up for the Kickstarter on there which by the time this airs, it should be out. So yeah, check that out. Chosenjuan.com for the uh, issue two of the Chosen Juan. It's like a, it's inspired by like Rick and Morty. It's really weird and funny. And just, we we make fun of conspiracies and have fun at the same time, you know? Mm. Uh, and yeah, you can check me out. TJOJP.com, patreon.com slash the one on one. You can go to Linktree uh, slash Joel Thomas Media. You can find anything from my music to the new podcast coming out uh, at Joel Thomas Media anywhere right now. That's where you're going to be able to find me. I got a ton of crazy projects coming out with Merkle Media. Tony and I had a long talk about one of the mm-hmm. insane ones that we got coming out. So that's going to be mind blowing. Bonkers. Yeah. I'm yeah. proud of you, Joel. Yeah. So proud appreciate of you. that. C- come such a long way. You know? I'm proud of all you guys. You guys are doing great. <laughs> Listen, uh, this was this is a fantastic conversation. We're going to continue it in the overtime. Uh, people listening right now or watching on YouTube, uh, if you're a member, just log into your membership account on the app or on the website, and you can get the second half of this conversation in the overtime section. If you're not a member, you got to become a member to check out the second half. If not, no big deal. Until next Tuesday, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free. But first, first it'll piss you off. Bye. Bye. Hey, everybody, before we get... Oh, where's my headphones? Where's my headphones? Hey, everybody, before we get to this week's episode, I want to let you YouTubers know we are changing some things around here. We are absolute... Blah, blah, blah. Today, we are launching YouTube memberships. Yay! Starting today, moving forward, we're... Do- it's because many years now, people have been telling me from YouTube, I don't like watching YouTube or... <laughs> Hey everybody, for poor, blah, blah. everything will be here on YouTube for you guys right starting today. Okay, here we go. Last take. <clears throat>
It's not that hard. It's like 40 seconds. Just get it out of your mouth. Hey, everybody, before we get to this week's episode, I want to let you know I was cooking. I was cooking. Hey, everybody, before we start this episode today, that's not what you say. Hey, everybody, before we start this show, nope. Hey, everybody, before we start this show, no. What's this, what's it called? Episode, right? Hey, everybody, before we start the episode today, nope, that's not what you're saying. What was I saying? Do you remember? Do you think I have enough outtakes that you can work with? <laughs> you're like, bro, yeah. <laughs> You've been recording for 10 minutes and 35 seconds, yeah. <laughs> okay. Five more, five more tries. Welcome to the show. Freaking A! <laughs> what the? <laughs> I... I Two more tries. <sighs> and then moving forward, all the content is available to you as YouTube members. That was it! That was freaking, I got, I did it! That's the one. That's the one, okay? That's the one I want. That's the freaking one I want. We're done. Something they can define I just never knew a box I couldn't decline I never thought of being one of a kind I just spent my time elevating my mind This is my confession Whoa, whoa, whoa The lights around me beckon Yeah, yeah, yeah Lost in my reflection No, no, no I ain't trying to go away at all I don't know if I'm caught up in the lights on the mesa so bright Makes me think about life In the desert that's swallowing me whole I'm just trying to cruise on a trail But I know that my scream Is written in a way That will make it easy for me I know I know you Don't know my truth I spin my So bright. 